All right. Welcome everyone to today's session. My name is Vamsi Rawla. I work at Red Hat in the API management and app connectivity technologies, uh, more specifically fo focused on uh, Red Hat Services to Connect, which is based on the open source project Scupper. We'll be talking about that and how it will kind of you know enable this whole locationless APIs, what locationless APIs are, and then we'll go through the interesting part of a demo towards the end, right? We'll go get through some slideware, so please bear with me through that, but but I, I, I promise we'll, we'll, we'll show a demo again. Demo gods permitting, we'll see a nice demo towards the end. So most of us, or anybody who's developing or into the software business has built APIs, worked with APIs, and we all know how important APIs are. They're fundamental to any business, helps us build an ecosystem, you know, act as a central nervous system to your software platforms today. Your web and mobile depends on APIs. But, uh, you know, creating and exposing APIs is just the start, right? Uh, there is a lot more to APIs than just creating and exposing them, right? From, again, people who are aware of the whole API gateway, API management practice, the next few slides might seem a little bit redundant, but, but again, we'll get through that pretty quickly. But creating and exposing APIs is just the start, right? You need to take care about securing your APIs. How do I authenticate it? How do I rate limit it? Access control, metering, billing, et cetera, right? And, and on, a, on a high level, you know, this is, this is how you typically protect your APIs. You know, you have an API gateway, you deploy it beside your API backend or an API upstream, and, and you know, it, it acts as a real proxy to each your APIs when, when you start it, and, and you might provide keys and, and whatnot to your APIs when doing an application. And, and you know, if an API is not doing an application, it doesn't even know the actual location of your API backend. They can only reach your API backend through your API gateway and through this uh, authentication and permission that I talked about. This is nothing new. It has been in place for probably 10 to 20, 30 years now, but again, this is a very simplistic view, right? The API gateway and the API backend are in the same MRE same network, and the gateway can communicate with the backend directly because they're in the same network, and the setup is, is fairly straight. But, but in today's world, you know, we have organizations that are that have different development teams that, that are deploying their APIs in different types of environments, whether it be AWS, Azure, GCP, and different types of Kubernetes, Kubernetes based on, on VMs, Linux, mainframes. So APIs are dispersed even within a single organization. There are at least two to three different platforms. Is this good? Okay. Probably use the, use this mic. Sorry for the interruption. As I was saying, right, you know, in a typical organization today, we have at least two, to, uh, the APIs are dispersed across two to three different types of environments and uh, for, for different reasons, right? It could be due to regulatory, um, it could be due to the data residency rules that they have, or if they want to protect sensitive data, some organizations would like to have some APIs in public cloud and the more sensitive APIs in their private data centers and would like to distribute them across these environments. And also some, some APIs uh, and, and also deploy across different clouds just to save the cost, right? So all these different, re there could be a myriad of reasons why the APIs could be dispersed in any given single organization, could be dispersed across multiple footprints. So with that said, we've seen this simplistic image, you know, API Gateway can access your API backend, but when your APIs are dispersed across these environments, how does your API Gateway uh, really know where these APIs are and how can it manage, uh, you know, your APIs and also, you know, control access to these APIs to the external API consumers? So currently there are some solutions. It's not like there are no solutions today. Uh, for example, you can deploy as many gateways in the different environments that they are there. For example, if you say you have three different environments or three different clouds and where your APIs are present, 
you can deploy a di each instance of the gateway in these three different environments. Again, that is, though not a bad practice, it's very resource intensive, right? Uh, it is, your, the number of gateways that you deploy is, is directly proportional to the number of environments or probably in some cases that if you're talking about Kubernetes, it could be the number of namespaces that you have and that's, that's really not, not scalable. And the other way could be, you know, you could use proprietary vendor runtimes and the vendors kind of, uh, you know, the cloud vendors kind of uh, give you a way on how to discover those APIs. But, but again, you're kind of logged into their uh, whole ecosystem and the cloud. It doesn't really give the flexibility to deploy outside those cloud environments. Another option would be, you know, public exposure of upstream URLs. Uh, you know, this is the most dangerous and the most unsecure option. You know, you, you have a public URL for your API and then, uh, you know, manage it using the API gateway and then just, just pray to God saying, hey, nobody discovers the public URL of your gateway and just accesses your API through the uh, API gateway, right? So that's, that's again, a very insecure way. So, some people, some organizations do it by regulating the headers that you pass on to the API gateway and only... And the API backend will only accept calls if uh, from the headers that the API gateway adds and rejects every other call that is there, right? But but again, this is not a very secure way of you know managing your APIs using the API gateway. And the other option is you know setting up VPN, VPCs, firewalls, dedicated networks between your API gateways and API backend, right? Again, this is a very secure way, uh, no no doubt about it. But when you have to build that such complex networking things between your API and API gateway, and again, if you have multiple APIs across multiple environments, building that complex networking tunnels becomes a challenge and a time consuming thing that will actually delay the velocity of your development team. So with that said, uh, what, what we really want to achieve with locationless API management is, you know, have a single gateway that can discover your APIs across multiple environments, but at the same time, reduce the complexity and uh, that, that we've seen, and also may, at, at the same time, do not compromise on the security of your APIs and have a single pane of discoverability and visibility for all your scattered APIs across these different environments. So the goal of locationless API management as a concept is to reduce the complexity and increase the visibility. So how do we do this? So uh, anybody who's heard about Scupper here? Uh, so one, anybody else? So Scupper is, so Scupper, what, what Scupper does in this context is, and then I'll tell you what Scupper is as a technology, right? Scupper is an open source project. So Scupper, what it does is, it, it takes all your APIs, all, it makes all the APIs that are dispersed across this disjointed environments and make it seem like they are, lo they are local services wherever the gateway is deployed. For example, say you're deploying your gateway in a Kubernetes cluster, and your APIs are in, in another cluster running on a RHEL VM and different environments. What Scupper does is it makes all these APIs seem like they are local to your API gateway in the cluster that, it, that, that it's residing on. How it does that, we'll see through the demo and a couple of explanations. But that's 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 how Scupper really helps. So Scupper is a uh, Scupper helps build what Scupper builds what we call a virtual application network. It's basically nothing but layer seven connectivity. So when you when you use Scupper to establish this network, basically you're you're creating pin pin holes within your services, and and tell Scupper to expose the services over over the Scupper network. So only the services that you expose over this Scupper network are accessible to other services that are a part that are part of the network and you control which services to expose which services to not expose and Scupper is, is a CLI tool you also have a Kubernetes operator for Scupper either way you can either do it declaratively or using the CLI command utility but in essence you are building a layer 7 network by establishing uh, you know Scupper routers in the different environments and and because we're talking about complexity, we'll actually build a Scupper network and connect APIs deployed across different environments within a few minutes here versus think about building complex VPNs, right? That, that we'll see in the demo. And again, it's, 
it's layer 7 addressing the communication between the scupper routers is mtls encrypted so the security part is taken care of and and the other important part is you know uh, the the services refer to each other using abstracted names so you are kind of taking out ip addresses out of the question here right you are accessing the apis or services using the names that are given to them on the scupper network so even as until this api is part of the network even if it even if the ip address changes and if it has the same service name on the scupper network that you build the connectivity still remains so it really makes your network and your services portable so that was scupper uh, in, in in a really you know quick way we could we could talk about it all day but but i'll show you a simple use case on on how we establish this network and then go to you know our a whole locationless api management and kind of go through that right so imagine a public cluster uh, i'm saying cluster here but it could be any environment right so imagine a public kubernetes cluster where you have an app which will use this api let me just take a pen that's so it's easier to mark here which will use this api here and which will use this api here right so and this app could be the gateway in our example but let's let's just assume for the simplicity's purpose to understand how scupper works this app wants to use that api but the api is in a private cluster that doesn't allow any ingress and it doesn't have any publicly exposed routes or it's uh, or it could also be in a vm that's not it doesn't allow any ingress connections inward connections right so how do we do that so we use scupper to establish the connectivity so first we use and we are going to the demo is going to use the scupper cli tool so first we'll use the scupper init command to establish the scupper routers the scupper routers are very similar to your layer 3 routers in the sense that they know the location of the services where they are and and we are just showing two environments here but it could be 3 4 or 10 different environments that form a mesh of all these routers together so each of the router can redirect to each other to find where the actual location of the services so initially we are establishing the routers here still both these environments do not know anything about each other no connectivity established so next what we do is in the publicly accessible cluster or the uh, or the cluster that access that that accepts ingress connections we create a token the token has all the connectivity information and also the tls certificates for the security purposes and then transfer this token to to this environment so the the router in the private cluster will use this certificate to establish the connection in this direction right so it will use this certificate using the scupper link create secret token so the scupper link create command is used to create that link between these routers and and the beauty of it is though you are establishing the connection in one direction from the private to the public cluster the network that is formed is a bidirectional network and though it is very simplistic right imagine a scenario where you have five different apis in a single environment and you want to expose it over the network without scupper you are probably opening five different ports right but with scupper just the route only communicates over the i think the tls port and then that's the only port the communication happens on and the rest of the communication is taken by the taken care of the router to the services so instead of uh, opening five or six or 10 ports for exposing five or six or 10 services you are just you are open you know you are just establishing the router that talks over the 443 port so once you establish the link the bidirectional network is formed but still this app will not be able to use the apis right because it, it doesn't it should not be in a way that you know once the network is established the app is able to use all the services in the network so through through scupper you can control which services or which apis you want to expose over the network so once you so once you do the scupper expose you could either expose a deployment you could either expose a service you could either expose a container and, and there are different modes right but once you hit the scupper expose command a virtual service will be formed in the public cluster saying that hey this is the service that you can that this is your actual api that you can call to get the api response the app doesn't really know where the location of this actual api so it 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 thinks it it has an api in its local environment and it will call the api and the 
uh, the, a the virtual service of the API. The virtual service will look like a local Kubernetes service or a local service if you're running it in a VM. It will call this local service and the call goes to the router and from one router to the other and to the API and back. So that's how the, you know, the connectivity is established and you know, the secure, the, the, all the communication between the routers is MTLS encrypted. So that's, that's that. Uh, it's, that's, that's the simplistic way on how you establish the network, right? And now in our demo, just replace this app with the API gateway. Our API, now we want our API gateway to discover these APIs that are there in this multiple private clusters. And that's what our demo is, is really going to be about. Any questions until now? I'm happy to take any questions in the middle too, no problem. You know, if I'm not able to show anything, that's fine, but please go ahead. Um, yeah, could you go over the path at which the um, at which the local service um, yeah on, on which the lo on, on which the local service uh, establishes the network again yeah yeah whether it goes you, you said it goes from the router to the service um, uh, to the um, yeah you mean that this this oh uh, yeah yeah that yes. so so basically once you do the shuffle expose command this virtual service is automatically included in the cluster and the application will call this virtual service. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it will basically call this virtual service, and because on this virtual service, the pod that it points to on a cluster is the pod of the shuffle router. So as soon as you call this, the call goes directly to the shuffle router. And the shuffle router and the attack goes like this. And you have because you only have two routers, it's only set to one router. Yeah. If you have a mesh of routers, it broadcasts it, and the router will. Actually knows the location of it. It will pick it up and then send it to your API gear and then it comes back. But it does it through the um and it does it through the token. Um, the token is to establish the network. Once okay. the once the net network is established, they can communicate uh, without the token. The token is to establish the network and also provide the services which are the MTLS encrypted. Okay, and, and the uh and the NTL and the TLS port that's the TLS port that's found in one of the uh, networks, right? Which right. is then sent to the uh, private Correct. cluster. The communication happens over the TLS. Okay. That's the only port that that the communication is happening. And even if you have like four or five different APIs, you won't need to open up any port. That's what I was trying to say. And and the the stack port is going to remain. Okay. And it does does it do it consecutively. Just open each yeah. Does it open each port consecutively or uh, just to conserve just to kind of conserve the um. Conserve conserve compute power, I guess, or I, it's just one port that's okay. Open right oh, okay. So okay. No, uh, any reason for opening oh. multiple ports? Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's get to the demo time. Hopefully, you know, demo gods permitting and the network permitting. So what we have here is, you know, I have uh, OpenShift cluster in uh, in AWS, one OpenShift cluster in one OpenShift cluster in AWS, one OpenShift cluster in Azure, and one Red Hat Enterprise Linux VM. And the VM is, and, and these could, these need not be Red Hat OpenShift or Red Hat uh, Linux, right? It could be any Linux or any Kubernetes, but it's free and easy for me to deploy this environment, so I just chose to use them. But in the VM, we are running a Node.js API, and in the Azure cluster, I'm using, I'm running a Quarkus API. Those are very simple APIs. Again, I'm, I'm a little bit lazy, so don't judge me by the results of the APIs, but you have a list of routes and a list of books. These are local APIs, uh, not accessible publicly towards the internet. Of the Quarkus API is currently now, but I will delete the publicly accessible route as we do the, do the, do the demo. So let's go ahead and do that. So are, the, are you guys able to see this? this size of the font, all good? All right, so the orange color is AWS. The blue color terminal is connected to my Azure cluster. And the red color one is my RHEL VM. And the RHEL VM, and I have a little cheat sheet here because I didn't want to, you know, get, <laughs> get reminded or get, get make any mistakes while typing. So here you can see my Node.js API that is running here. 
in the rel vm it gives a list of books and it's 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 a local it's local host and for the quarkus api if you go to the browser here you'll see a list of routes again this is again publicly accessible right now what i'll do is i'll go ahead and delete the publicly accessible route so that this quarkus api becomes local so let me go ahead and uh, just delete the route Sorry about the screen switching, but uh, just bear with me here. So I've deleted the publicly accessible route, as you can. Let me just move this out here. Yeah, I've deleted the publicly accessible route, and oh gosh, okay. And once you refresh this, right, the application is not available. So we have two APIs that are not publicly accessible. One is in the local host. Uh, in a VM, one is running in uh, an OpenShift cluster as a local service. Now we'll use Copper to, you know, connect all, and, and my API gateway is running in the AWS OpenShift cluster here, as you can see in the image. Where is my image? Yeah, so this is, this is what we have currently. So first, I'll use the Copper init command to establish the routers here, as you'll see. So let me quickly go ahead and do that. And again, I've not set up anything previously, so we are building these connections live here. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So my AWS cluster is the publicly accessible cluster, so that's where I'll be generating the actual tokens and distributing the tokens. So let's first initialize the routers in all the environments. Uh, I can type this out. In it. All right, I think I just have to set the environment variable for it because it's using Podman container. So we need to specify it, if it's a Kubernetes or a Podman container that we want to connect to. So let me go ahead and do scupper in it now. So they'll take a a minute or so to establish again with the network I think they'll they might take a little longer but uh, as we see here when you go back here once the routers are established we will create what we call the scupper tokens in the publicly accessible cluster and distribute them to both these so that both these environments can use the tokens to establish the network so let's see if our, if our routers have been initialized Uh oh, that happens with the network, right? Let me try again. <laughs> or I should probably just connect to my hotspot. So. Okay, it's probably going up now. Yes, okay, cool. The network's finally blessed us. And then we have scupper routers established there. Now what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to create the tokens as I've shown in the image. I'm going to create two tokens, one for the Azure and one for the VM in my AWS environment, as you can see in the orange tab here. And uh, yeah, the tokens are created. And once the tokens are created, I'll transfer the tokens to both the clusters. I'm going to do that now. Provide the password to transfer the token to the cluster. Sorry, I have to copy paste a lot of things here. Let's see if the token is here. Yeah, we have the token and we also have the the Azure token here. So let us go ahead and, so what we'll do next is, once the tokens are created, we transfer the tokens, and using that tokens, we use the scupper link command to establish the network. So that's what we are going to do right now. So let's go ahead and do that, scupper link. First for the Azure, that's pretty fast. And then for the rel VM. Is 
Right. So now we've established the network. Now let's go to our AWS cluster and see if anything happened at all, right? I'm going to go and see the services here. I still can't see both my Quarkus API and Node.js APIs here. So, but what we have not done is we have not told Scupper which services I want to expose over the network. So I'm going to use the Scupper expose command to expose the services. And that's when this virtual services will be created on my OpenShift cluster on AWS. So let us go ahead and do that. Scupper expose. Yep. And scupper expose on rel. Let's create this proxy service here. AWS environment. So now when you go back to your OpenShift cluster, you should see both the Quarkus API and the Node.js API showing up as local services in the AWS cluster whereas these APIs are residing somewhere else. So now, when I go to my API gateway, I'm using Red Hat's three scale API management, which provides an API gateway and whole API management, but you, you, it could be an, any other API gateway that you could deploy on Kubernetes. So when you go ahead and say, create product, you could, you could you know, add, add the local OpenShift service here uh, as an upstream URL, or you can use the import from OpenShift option where it will show the APIs actually. So I have, I, for three scale to actually discover the APIs in OpenShift, you just have to label them so that three scale knows which services to discover and which to not discover. Obviously, you do not want it to discover every service that exists on OpenShift, right? So let me just quickly do that. Uh, have a small script that will just add labels to all my containers pretty quickly. And uh, yep, that should do it. And once I go back to my cluster and hit from OpenShift, you should see both these APIs. Again, imagine what we've done, right? Both these APIs sitting in different clusters, different environments. We are disc our, API our API gateway that is sitting somewhere else is able to you know, manage and discover these APIs automatically. So let's, let's quickly go and create an API application and configurations around it and see if the API, if the gateway is actually, if an API, if an application is actually able to call the API through the gateway, right? So let me quickly do that. Let me create. This is all, uh, you know, three scale details, but uh, please bear with me here. I'll make it pretty quick. And let's create an API. This is the actual application that will, uh, you know, we'll we'll get a key for. Come on create application, and then once you go back to the Node.js configuration, and uh, there you go, you should, you should have this here, let me just copy it, and let's just see if I'm able to access this API here. What was that? I did the, I copied the curl. I wanted to show it in a browser so it's easier to view, but yeah, I copied the curl. You see, so now we are able to access the APIs through the gateway and it is authenticated through an API key. And if I give the wrong key, obviously it, you, you, you'll say authentication failed, but, but you know, you should be able to see the API. I know I'm a little close to the end of time, but I want to show one more thing, if you guys are okay. Uh, uh, what, what I really want to show is, you know, again, if you, if you have another instance of the Node.js API deployed in, in Azure, say you have same Node.js API in two different environments, and you add them to the Scupper network with the same name, Scupper will automatically, and you don't need to do anything else, Scupper will automatically load balance between both of them, and if one goes down, Scupper will automatically route to the other instance. And again, no additional configuration. You just need to add uh, that instance with the same service name. And, and that that's, talks about the anycast, multicast capabilities of Scupper. So I can, I can actually quickly show that, you know. Let me just quickly deploy the app here. And 
I'm deploying the app. I'm deploying another instance of the Node.js in Azure cluster. And I am going to kill the instance in my VM. So now we sh should not be able to access the API because we still haven't exposed the service over the network with the same name. So what I'm going to do is going to do uh, the scupper expose command. So I'm exposing the Node.js API on my Azure environment with the same name on the network so that, uh, you know, uh, and the API gateway wouldn't realize what is happening, right? It, it, it thinks, okay, the service is down, but when we introduce it with a new name, with the same name, you know, the service is back up. And we should be able to go back and see our API is back up, right? But again, it's in a different environment coming up. Uh, API gate, and if they're simultaneously present, and if it go, if one goes down, another is live, the API gateway wouldn't even realize if something went down and uh, Scupper takes care of this automatic uh, uh, load balancing and failover. So that uh, kind of brings me to the end of my presentation. I hope you know you guys took something away. Again, some use cases and applications of this whole uh, locationless API management is you know think about mergers and acquisitions where different companies have different environments that that and and but after mergers you want to have a single pane of discoverability for the APIs. Cost reduction, redundancy, we've seen an example of it. And again, legacy APIs, right? Again, some legacy APIs uh, don't really fit into the scenarios, but if you can uh, expose them as local OpenShift services, you know, it, it makes them more discoverable and, uh, you know, helps in reuse. Here are some resources where you can learn more about Scupper. The first one is is a is a Insta Lab that you can just go and uh, try out Scupper. The second one is about uh, a blog about this locationless API management, and you can actually try this out in your uh, local environment if interested. So that brings me to the end of my session. Again, thank you all for uh, uh, attending my session and hope you guys found it useful. I'm, I'm happy to take questions if I have time, but otherwise I'll be, I'll be right outside and uh, happy to chat with any of you. I have two minutes, I think, right? Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, please. This, this is more of a comment, so um, one of the things that I've been hearing a lot in the space is the, the transition in the future towards um, digital sovereignty instead of data sovereignty, right? Which is a concept that countries not only want their data to reside within country, but within the country, but they want it to run on infrastructure that's within the country, right? That way, if you know something political happens, they don't lose you know certain levels of control of being able to run vital assets. And here I can see this as another use case where. Now you have multiple environments that you have to support. Maybe, you know, as a company, I am transitioning to that, but I support, you know, off and off the somewhere globally, but I make sure that I'm running that data and that infrastructure in country with this kind of API, you know, locationless concept. Correct. So, that's, cool. that's a good point, right? Again, uh, let's take Europe and U US, for example, right? And say I have the same API, same data, but just because of regulations, I have to run two instances of these APIs. I can actually give weights and assign costs to the scupper links, saying, hey, if the call comes from here, this is the cost of this link, and redirect you to th this link, and vice versa, based on where the call com comes from. So you can actually, the links that I've shown, you can assign costs to those links, and by default, it'll go to one link, and uh, it can go to the other based on that. So uh, a great point. Any, anybody else? I, I saw one more hand up, but all right, I think we're good. Thank you so much.